Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for our country. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for our history, our heritage. We thank you for your hand upon this nation. And Lord, just as we're looking in the Bible, Lord, we know the parallels. We know that America is not Israel and Israel is not America. But Lord, there are many parallels as we see your great hand of blessing on this country. And yet, Lord, as we're going even finishing the minor prophets and as we're studying, we see many parallels to the downfall of Israel. And Lord, uh, even though America is not what she once was, not what we desire her to be, Lord, we still see even in the minor prophet books that there is hope. God, you said to, to Haggai, to Zechariah, to the people, I'm still with you. may not be the same as it was in the glory days of David and Solomon, but I'm with you. Let's get busy. And so, Lord, we can still, even in America's state today, be serving you, be light in this dark world. It's time for the church, Lord, to wake up, and I pray you'd help me to be part of that. Thank you for those that are here tonight, our teenagers, our young people, our teachers. Lord, we're asking you to continue to see young people saved, adults saved, surrendered, sanctified, growing and walking with you, Lord. And we ask your blessing tonight as we dig into the Word of God. Help us now as we lift up our voice in praise. May our hearts be overflowing with praise for you, Lord, our God and our Creator. In Jesus' name. Amen. This month, we're going to do what we did last month. This will be a little bit more of a little theme. We're not doing themes all year, but just during the summer months. Last month was Sunday school month. And this month's going to be a continuation of what we did last year, a little bit of God in America, a little bit of American history. We won't read something every single time, but we will on occasion. I think that's good. I hope that you take some time, especially parents, to make sure that uh, hopefully everyone, you know, you know the true history. A lot of stuff that's out there today of America. There's uh, plenty of great books that we can recommend there for that. So just before we get back into Malachi, I'm going to read one that I haven't read before again from the book, 100 Bible Verses That Made America. I know Dave has this. I know Arnie and there may be a few of you, so you may say, I remember this one. But I'm going to go back and read a little story that predates America. All right. In fact, much of what made America America takes place in the 1600s and the 1700s, 150 years before. Those 150 years, I know we often know about the pilgrims and we may know a few things. All right. But sometimes we don't realize the foundation that was laid that made America for its independence. All right, and many of the godly chaplains, the preaching that would go on from the pulpits back in those days, they had politics very much involved in the pulpit. All right, uh, the Bible Foundation, the Christian colleges that were churning out preachers, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, I mean, they were churning out godly men that were just pre America was just, wow, the Great Awakening. All of that stirring the pot, if you would, for America. So I'm just reading a story that took place August 17th. 1755, August 17th, 1755. In the mid-1700s, both France and England, of course, had colonies in America. Because you look back on God's providence, right? If, what if the French had become, you know, had won? That, well, French, that's Catholic, all right? You, you look at America, you know, and all those kind of things. And, uh, and both France and England had colonies. Of course, we know the French and Indian War, which preceded the American Revolution by about a decade. The French colonies, having a very smaller population, allied, of course, with Native American tribes to fight the English. The British administrator of Virginia, his name was Robert Dinwiddie. He selected a 21-year-old soldier named George Washington to travel from Williamsburg, Virginia, to northwest Pennsylvania on a diplomatic mission to try to avoid the war. The negotiations failed, but the attempt was well publicized and made young George a household name. Remember, there's no America yet, just colonies. Later, during the ill-fated battle of the Monongahela, probably not pronouncing that right there, near present-day Pittsburgh, George Washington, who was recovering from an illness, exhibited remarkable courage and leadership when the British forces marched into an ambush and suffered a disastrous defeat. Washington's survival was actually miraculous. After the battle, as he wrote a letter to his mother, I quote George, I luckily escaped without a wound, though I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot from underneath me. I was not half recovered from a violent illness that had confined me to my bed and to a wagon for ten days. Washington believed that God had providentially protected him, and it gave him confidence in God's guarding guiding hand. Writing to his brother John, he said, by, all the, by the all-powerful dispensation of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability. For I had four bullets through my coat, two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side. 
The Native Americans were equally perplexed at George Washington's survival. One of the chiefs had repeatedly fired at him and ordered his young warriors to do the same, every one of them being a true marksman. But their bullets were turned aside by some invisible and inscrutable interposition. Chief Red Hawk claimed to have personally shot at Washington 11 times. Another chief perplexed at Washington's survival is said to have predicted he will become the chief of nations and a people yet unborn will hail him as the father of a mighty empire. Can't understand why this young man can't be shot or killed. What's going on? Washington's incredible survival created a sensation in the colonies. And many felt God's hand was on him for a special purpose. That opinion was expressed in a famous sermon preached in Hanover County, Virginia, August 17th, 1755, by preacher Samuel Davies. I'm going to make sure I read the right verse that he uses as his text. Davies was a Presbyterian evangelist whose wife had died from a miscarriage shortly before their very first anniversary. He himself was battling tuberculosis. He wanted to use every moment for the Lord. He wrote hymns, advanced the Great Awakening, served as the president of Princeton which was a Christian colony, uh, university in the colony, and preached sermons that left a huge impression on the colonies. His text that morning, his, was, his title was Religion and Patriotism. He preached to Captain Overton's independent company of volunteers and encouraged the troops to bravery. His text was 2 Samuel 10, 12. Be of good courage. Let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. Be of good courage. Let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. Now, that's a quote from David. All right, King David there is the men were going to battle. He spoke of the defeat near Pittsburgh, but reminded the soldiers that God governs the world. As a remarkable instant of this, he said, this is during his sermon, I may point out to the public that heroic youth, Colonel Washington, whom I cannot but hope Providence has hitherto preserved in so signal a manner for some important service to his country. That was 1755. Davies didn't live long enough to see how prophetic his words were. He died in 1761 at the age of 37. His text, however, lives on. The eye of providence that preserved young Washington hasn't lost its keenness. The hand that steers the stars and turns the pages of history is the same that arranges our days and gives us grace that we need. And, of course, we know that George Washington played a huge part, obviously, in American history uh, as the first chief commander there and the first president. And when you start looking at a lot of the great messages, you see how many messages were preached and how the pulpit played a huge part in our American heritage and history. Today, most people would say, no, you can't have any of that. But they don't know the history of America. All right, we are in Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament. Right, if you have trouble finding Malachi, it's, it's more a matter of mental, right? If I said turn to Matthew 1, no problem. If I say Malachi 4, oh, that's hard to find. All right. Now, uh, there's just probably on the same page or one page in between. But Malachi is where we're at. This would be part two of a transitional message that uh, we're going to transition over the next few weeks, maybe just a little bit, not into a true series of looking at the what happened between the Testaments, what happened between Malachi and Matthew. You know, what happened between the last prophet and the first or the final prophet, John the Baptist. All right, what's going on? How do we explain uh, the scene upon which Jesus came? Well, a lot of that's all explained as we've been going through the Minor Prophets, and especially in this final book, the book of Malachi. Not all of you maybe were with us last, uh, not last week, two weeks ago. Last week was Bible school, but two weeks ago I, I preached out of the book of Malachi and sort of gave a general overview. And so I want to do that again today, but take it a little bit farther. Malachi chapter 1. Verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Small little verse there. Malachi is the final Old Testament prophet. This is the final message from God. He's the final 
messenger. There won't be another one for over 400 years. So what's God's final word here before we would, in a way, say, close, boom, the Old Testament scriptures? Well, that's the book of Malachi. But before we jump into that a little bit more, let me, let me just remind you of a few things. It's easy to remember this. If you like to take notes or you don't have a good study Bible, maybe to help you there. Uh, the number three is prominent here as we get to the end of the Old Testament. There are three remnant prophets. It means prophets that prophesied after the captivity. We call that the remnant, the group that came back. There are three remnant leaders. And there are three remnant objectives. Okay, so the first leader was Zerubbabel. And it's easy to remember if you're teaching a kid's class or Bible class. Zerubbabel, his number one objective was to rebuild what? The temple. All right, so you think of Zerubbabel. He's coming back with the first group of about 50,000 that were given permission by Cyrus to go back to build the temple. And so Zerubbabel is the leader. He's the governor. He's royal seed. He's from the line of David, line of Josiah. And so his number one objective, along with Joshua, the high priest, is going to be to rebuild the temple. That's what we've been looking at Sunday mornings, Haggai. All right? Consider your ways. Rebuild it. All right, you can read about that in the first chapters of Ezra. So you have Zerubbabel, first leader, rebuild the temple. And who's the prophet? Haggai and Zechariah. And then the second man to come back 60 to 70 years later is Ezra. Only a small group, less than 2,000. He's coming back to rebuild the people. If you want a simple outline. Zerubbabel, rebuild the temple. Ezra, rebuild the people. We're talking about spiritually. They need some spiritual guidance. They need a spiritual leader. All right? The temple's been rebuilt. They're going through the motions. But we need a, we need a spiritual leader to... Get them together, all right? And that is Ezra. Then the third and final man is Nehemiah. Nehemiah doesn't really come back with a group. He's sort of an individual, though he may have people with him. He gets the burden. He's coming back to rebuild the what? The walls. Now, yes, there is rebuilding of the people with Zerubbabel, and there's rebuilding of the people with Nehemiah. But remember those three men. Zerubbabel, first, the temple. Ezra, second, the people. Nehemiah, third, the walls. Ezra and Nehemiah will overlap. You can see that in the book of Nehemiah. You'll see them working together after the walls have been rebuilt to spiritually get the people, and God does a, a revival there among the people, and that's exciting to see, all right? So your three remnant prophets... Haggai, Zechariah, and the last one, Malachi. Malachi is believed to have lived at the time of Nehemiah or 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years afterwards. That's the time period. So if you really want to get the spiritual flavor, what's going on? What's the attitude of the people? I wonder what their spiritual temperament is. What if we gave him a spiritual checkup? All you need to do is read the end of Ezra, the end of Nehemiah, and the book of Malachi, and you'll find exactly the attitude of the people. And you're going to see how difficult it would be <laughs> to, to stir them up because they're, they're satisfied. The temple's been rebuilt. The walls are rebuilt. We're good. We're good. And they're going through the motions. And they go to the temple and they do the stuff and they do some of the stuff they're supposed to. But there's a very apathetic, lethargic, comfortable, bored, spiritual life. Now, I'm giving you an overview because that's important because that's going to lead into the 400 years between the two testaments. And it's only going to get worse. So that when all of a sudden you open up the Bible to the New Testament... And you see what life was like when Jesus Christ began his ministry. What did he come upon? <laughs> what was going on in Judah and Galilee? What, what was going on? I mean, what happened? You know, like, what, that just was the, that's just a continuation of what we're seeing right here at the end of the Old Testament, especially from the book of Malachi. This is the prevailing attitude that's going to take place over four centuries, and from that it's going to spring some big religious groups. 
the Pharisees are going to pop up, which means strict, holding to the Old Testament laws, very strict and conservative. Oh, the Sadducees, more of a political party. They're very liberal, very loose, very wealthy. They're going to pop up, right? I mean, aren't they the two main groups that are going to always be clashing with Jesus Christ? Uh huh. You've got the Herodians that pop up, a political group that backs Herod, that has the pockets in Rome. All right. You got all, and you got the scribes, and you got the lawyers, and you got these groups, and they're working together. Some are for the Pharisees, the the priests, the the Sanhedrin, and boy, Jesus Christ, God Himself is going to be on the scene. Wow. What's everybody doing in the New Testament? Going through the motions, the Sabbath. Nobody looks forward to the Sabbath, all right? The Pharisees have made it so, ugh, everybody hates it, all right? Uh, you know, it's all tradition. Remember all the tradition? How many times did Christ, oh, oh my goodness, the tradition. You can't do that. That's not even in the Bible. That's man's tradition. And, and you see, and, and to the point where they killed him. And so it's very important. Anybody who would tell you that the Old Testament is not important uh, is either an ignorant or new Christian, or they just done a lot of bad reading. All right, you would not if you didn't. You wouldn't understand anything. We, you and I would not understand anything in the New Testament. It wouldn't make any sense. We have to have the Old Testament, and it's very important. The Minor Prophets, which are often not read, all right, very important. They are setting the stage for what is coming, Jesus Christ. So when we get to the Book of Malachi, this is the final messenger. He's going to sum up the spiritual temperature and attitude of the people. If you were to go back and read, and I'd encourage you to read, the last verse of Ezra talks about what, was Ezra, what did Ezra get when he came there? I cannot believe it. They are intermarried with all the other, the ites, the Canaanites, all the different ites. You've disobeyed God's laws, and they've married strange strangers, and they've intermarried, and Ezra can't believe it. All right? And the very end of the book, it talks about that. You get into Nehemiah, we studied Nehemiah a couple years ago. Think of all that happened to him once the walls were built. What were the problems? There were people that were working and selling on the Sabbath. Nehemiah is having it. This is the spiritual temperament. There's a brother, uh, fellow Jews, taxing fellow Jews and getting interest to get rich. What? They're not taking care of the priests and the spiritual leaders, the Levites, like they were supposed to. What? And Nehemiah is having to deal with this because the people are just not doing what God wanted them to do. And if you go through the book of Nehemiah, and they're, they're intermarried. And then it says that there's revival, and what happens? They begin reading the word of God, and they start saying, whoops, we didn't know that was in there. We're supposed to observe the Feast of Tabernacles? Okay. Whoops, we didn't know that we're supposed to let Moabites and Ammonites in the temple? I, whoops. And then Nehemiah comes, and they've got one of God's, not even a Jew, an enemy, is living in the temple. The high priest has got a buddy. And he's living in the storage rooms that was used for the treasury. And Nehemiah kicks him out. What are you? So when you're reading Ezra and Nehemiah and the book of Malachi, we better not be pointing our finger at those folks. Let's take a little temperature check at 2024. The Lord came on the scene today. He wouldn't be so as concerned about the lost, though he would be coming to seek and save the lost. His clashes in the New Testament times were among the religious. You hip, his strongest words were for the religious. Now, most of those were not believers, we'd say. But what did he come upon? Uh, religious. Everybody was going through religious ritual. Comfortable. Cold hearts. He said, oh my. Dull ears. Blind eyes. You, you like to have the muse, but your heart's not with me. You're just going through the motion. Oh, my goodness. And, you, you, and that, it'll make the New Testament come alive because that's just went downhill. Now, were there certain people who had a love for God? Absolutely. The Simeons, the Annas, the Zechariah and Elizabeth, the small group of people who were faithful to the thing. Of course, it's always been those folks. But yet you, you see all of that as we see what happened with Israel. And again, America, the church, is not Israel, but there are certainly many parallels we can make and applications that I believe are true, things that we can learn from, things that we can do spiritual checkups on our own and say, wow, could that be me? You know, wow, I want to make sure that's not me personally or my family or this church or any church I'm part of. Wow. So, so now we get into the book of Malachi, and again, uh, we, we're giving you a big overview. We'll only go about 10 minutes here. If you were with us two weeks ago, the book of Malachi is very short, but there's an eight-fold indictment brought 
almost like a lawyer that's going to give eight counts against you. And remember, Malachi is just saying, hey, you, you get mad at me? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm not the highest authority. I'm just a messenger for God. This is God's eightfold indictment against you. All right? So with all of that in mind, let me give you, the, let's go back and read the eightfold indictment, and you'll, get, you'll see exactly what we're talking about, the spiritual temperament of the people. It starts right away in verse 2. Malachi 1, 1 and 2. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Most of the book is a back and forth. God's going to speak, and then the people are going to respond. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? I have loved you. What? What do you mean? How have you loved us, God? Boom. Indictment number one. Number two, verse six. God says, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name? Number two, and ye say, you're almost always going to see that phrase, wherein have we despised thy name? What? This is the old, what? What are you talking about? God says, boom, and you're like, what? Not me. You're going to see in the responses here a mixture of sarcasm, arrogance, smugness, pride, defiance. But here's what I think is the saddest thing. I think when you go read all these things that these people, like you and I can get, have gotten to the point where they absolutely believe they're sincere. And when they say, how have you loved us? They believe they're right. They have so believed their own lie and their cart has gotten so cold, they've become so deceived that actually they believe we haven't done anything. It's God. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, maybe they're being defiant and rebellious and probably there is some of that. But the overall attitude you get when you read the whole thing, and I can, and I can get that way and I've been that way and so can you. To where you're like, what? No, it's not me at all. And you're, you, you actually believe that. And you've convinced yourself of that, that it's them. It's, it's God. It's the, it's the pastor. It's the evangelist. It's the parent. It's the good friend. This is not me. I can't believe what's wrong with them. God is God. Almighty God is saying, I have loved you. What do you mean? You haven't loved us. You despise my name. What? We don't, what are you talking about? We haven't despised your name. Oh, my goodness. Look at one of the things they were doing. Verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and valeth and sacrifices, sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. <laughs> you, you know what you're supposed to give me and you know what? You're, you're lying. You, you're not even bringing your best. You have exactly what you need to do and you're bringing second best, third best and acting like, what? Whoops. God says, you're, being, you're lying. I'm a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. What's the third indictment? Chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Verse 14, here it is again. Yet ye say, wherefore? Meaning like, what? We don't know what you're talking about. God, God's saying, boom. What? Hands in it. We haven't done anything. I can't believe you're acting that way. Why are you getting so mad? It's God. God's mean. God's a bully. God's not fair. That's, I mean, you, you ever get that way? Maybe you're that way right now. You, you turn everything around to where it's God. You, I don't know what God's talking about. Whoa, that's dangerous. That's the most dangerous place you can be where you've deceived yourself. And you see that with the, the people. End of chapter 2, what do you see? We saw rampant divorce. They've already had intermarrying. They're just divorcing. God says, I hate putting away the divorce. Look at the next one, verse 17. Number four, uh, what are we at here? Number one, two, three, four, number five. I might have skipped one. I think I did skip one. I skipped one, seven, sorry. I was like, that's not right. One, seven, I skipped. Ye offer polluted bread upon my altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? So I skipped seven by accident. So we're on number five here. What? Everything God says, you did this. What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. That's not true. God, you're being too hard. We haven't done any of that stuff. Verse 17, chapter 2, number 5, indictment. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, 
wherein have we wearied him? Notice what God says. God says, I'm going to answer you. When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? God says, I know what you've been saying. I heard it. You, I'm so weary of you. <gasps> Where, how, have we, what? how have we wearied you? We haven't anything. God replays it to them. And no response from the people as the messenger Malachi tells them what God has against them. Number six indictment, chapter three, verse seven. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Now God says, return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. God says, come back to me. But ye said, wherein shall we return? What are you talking about, God? We haven't gone anywhere. No, we don't have any need to return. I mean, that is so dangerous to get that way in your life. The heart is so cold, and you have so believed the lies you've told yourself that you actually absolutely believe that you're right, and they're like, no, God or his word's not true. What? Everybody's against me. What? Number seven, verse eight, chapter three. Will a man rob God? Ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? What? We haven't robbed you, God. God says, yes, you have in tithes and offerings. That's a whole other message, isn't it? We often jump on the tithe. You know, tithe means 10%. That's what the word tithe means. It means 10%. But if you go back and study Old Testament law, uh, the Jews, normally they were doing 30%. There was three or four separate offerings. They, had, they were commanded to. So and some were, were 40%. Uh, they, they had to give a, like a 10% just to take care of the Levites. Uh, they had to give, I mean, there was quite a few tithes, not to mention free will offerings. God says, you, you've been stealing from me. <gasps> We, don't, we have stolen anything. What are you talking about? Tithes and offerings. Oh, no. What are you talking about? All right. God, boom. Every time. We come down to the end here. Verse 13, chapter 3. Eighth and final indictment. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? What? We haven't said anything. What are you talking about? Your words have been stout against me. Yet ye say, you constantly are coming back. Now, what was it they were saying? Look what God said, verse 14. Ye have said, it is vain. It is worthless and empty to serve God. <gasps> you believe anybody would say that? God says, I'm going to tell you. I'm going I'm well, yeah, to tell you exactly what you've said. You have been telling people that it's empty and vain and worthless to serve God. And what profit is if we, we have, there's no profit in keeping God's laws and ordinances. What's the point? And that we have walked mournfully. Oh, we're always so sad. There's no joy. You know. Oh, my goodness. God, he, he has a lot. We're, we're only giving snapshots. You can go back and read it. You have Almighty God, faithful, merciful, gracious. How many times, how many times did he give them to repent? How many prophets did he send? How many times did he bless them even though he shouldn't have? How many times did he send warnings? How many even brought back the remnant and didn't destroy him? Now he sends a messenger and says, would you return unto me? Why are you playing games? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about, God. You're the one that's the problem. Oh, my goodness. You say, well, is there any hope in the book? It sounds like it's all boom, 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 boom. There's tremendous hope. We'll finish with two verses. Chapter number 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. Now, remember when this is written. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's the Old Testament prophecy of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is going to come, prepare the way before the Messiah. Then he's a second messenger in verse 1 of chapter 3. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, and it talks about who, what that's going to be, verses 2 and 3. You have to decide as you read that if that's talking about his first coming, his second coming, a little bit of both. And then what about chapter 4? Chapter 4, the final verses, the final message before there is no more from God in the Old Testament, if we would. For behold, the day cometh, the day. We've seen that throughout almost all the minor prophet books. The day cometh that shall burn as an oven. 
and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall have them neither root nor branch, but unto you, notice, here's, here's the remnant, but unto you that fear my name. Most of you, you have the attitude of everybody in the book, but there's not all of you. Unto you that fear my name shall the Son, and please notice the spelling there, The sun, S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. And he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And he shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Now we're talking about future kingdom, millennial, or a lot of, which is what a lot of the minor prophets are talking about. So what's the final message of the book? What's it, what's it before it's over? Boom. One last command to God's people. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with his head. Notice, last final command. Keep my laws. Remember what I've already told you and has been written down. That's what I want you to do. And then you have the final promise, the final prophecy of the Old Testament, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, personally, I don't believe that's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a type. John the Baptist is called that. But I, I believe if you look at verses 6 and 7, that's not been fulfilled yet because... John the Baptist did not come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. John the Baptist did come. He was the messenger, the voice in the wilderness. He was a type of Elijah, and Christ even said that in the Gospels. And verse 6 is applied to John the Baptist in the Gospels, but I do believe as well that this is talking about the real Elijah. I was taken to heaven in a whirlwind that has not died, that will be coming back, I believe, as one of the two witnesses before the great deadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Boom! Old Testament. No more. Final prophet, final messenger, final message. Did the people listen? What was it like, that 400 years or so of prophet? You know, what's going on between the... Well, we're going to look at that next Wednesday as we get into the New Testament a little bit there. Get some interesting and exciting things that die in with the Bible and history.